reading a great book. This is called You Belong. It's a, a new book, book written by Seven A Selassie. Uh, it just came out. It's available online. And so reading Seven A happens to be a student of Tanisra and Kitty Saros. Um, and I've been teaching from Listening to the Heart, this wonderful book by Tanisra and Kitty Saro. And so it's been interesting to read these books concurrently. Um, I've been, I pre-ordered this book and so I've been waiting for it, just knowing a little bit um, about 7A and having followed her teaching over the years. It's been very, and the topic, it's really um, dear to my heart. So I want to read um, a quote from the beginning of the book. In my late 30s, as my spiritual practice deepened, I began to confront what felt like a discrepancy in the theory of change to which I was dedicating myself. I had an are you my mother period where I asked the same question to every Buddhist teacher in class, on retreat, and in private conversation. I understand how practice can reduce my suffering. I see how it can transform my relationships with others and possibly affect change within them. But how will my spiritual practice change the forces of oppression? They seem so large and overpowering. The answer I usually received was something like, systems are made up of people and change begins from within. Greed, hatred, and delusion need to be uprooted inside each of us first for these forces to change. Yes, and. Many of these teachers were not talking about these forces, not explicitly. Greed, hatred, and delusion were spoken about as if they only existed on a personal level, not in relationship to everything else, identities, histories, power, gender, race, abilities, class. These forces are within each of us. To change them, we must acknowledge and understand them. The process is similar for any of us, but deepening on our life circum, depending on our life circumstances, it will not be the same. Although we are not one, we are not separate. And although we are not separate, we are not the same. Each of us must do the work of belonging, be curious about who we are, where we come from, and what it is we do and don't understand, what it is we do and don't understand about our delusions of separation. And so returning to this question, what does it mean to belong and what does it mean to belong to one another? Um, From so many weeks ago. And on one, on one level, It is totally true to deepen our understanding of belonging by understanding what it's like on a personal level. And in another way, it's absolutely essential to also continue that exploration by deepening our understanding of what it means to belong in the collective. And so to understand what it means to belong in the collective, it also includes what it means to belong on the individual. And so we might just take our, our practice and start by understanding how it is that we relate to our practice. And in the meditation, uh, I was encouraging us to really relax. And one of the great paradoxes is that it takes this kind of relaxed way of being to open to the truth of the way things are. It is really hard to accept our own 
bad habits when we're also tight about them. And this work of transforming habits of heart and mind, which we're very interested in as practitioners, begins with this relaxed approach, this complete acceptance of our habits of mind. And so we can see that as we learn to connect with the present moment, we can learn to really appreciate the way things have come to be the way that they are, the history, the forces that have contributed to who we are. We can start to see back even in track in in our own individual lineage that who we are is in direct relationship to our environment, to how we were raised, our family, the values that we have taken in, the ethics that we were taught, the way that we've practiced those ethics and reinforced those values. And we can also see that the way the world is and how the forces of uh, all the forces in the collective have actually often invisibly contributed to how we relate to our own lives and each other. And taking simple examples, like we sit down to meditate, we sit down to practice, and we get still, we study the heart, we study the body, just inviting some ease and relaxation in. And we see what's here, and we go, oh, yeah, body sensations. Oh, yeah, look at that, thoughts in the mind, or maybe some emotion here. And it's right here that we learn this practice of belonging. We learn to accept this, right? Because it doesn't make any sense to reject what's already here. It doesn't make any sense to reject grief if grief is what's showing up, or anxiety if anxiety is what's showing up, or fear, or anger, or sleepiness, It doesn't make any sense to reject the flow of life that's making itself known right here in our own hearts, right here in our own experience. And much the same way, it doesn't make any sense to reject what's actually moving in the world, to reject any of the forces of hatred. And so we can practice, we can use our practice, we can understand how to relate to the world through this, the way that we relate to our own individual experience, right? It's actually the same skill. And the paradox is that it seems weird to do this because it seems sort of intrinsically like we are supposed to reject that which isn't pleasant or that which isn't skillful. But it's actually, in my experience, not that way that that's not the root of transformation. That actually the root of transformation includes being super honest. It's like radical intimacy. So not rejecting even the bad habits, the unskillful forces of heart and mind that manifest right here and that have also historically had a major impact on who we are and how we live collectively. And we could name those. We could, you know, I could ask us to name them and there would probably be a dozen or more answers, obvious answers that we could give. Like we could name racism and domination. It's hard to deny these forces as we, Uh, live today. We can see that our habits around consumption, for example, have really become out of control. 
we can see how painful our habits of wanting to control life. And just in the way that we fight the conditions as they are, right? Like I can't, I will not be controlled. And that's a kind of control. Or we can see the way that police violence plays out in this mechanism of control, controlling bodies, controlling brown bodies, example. And if we look back throughout history, we can see all of the roots and the way that they manifest today. So part our practice in, is in this radical way. It's ah, saying yes and learning how to relax so that this, there is space for our engagement, for our participation. And so this idea of belonging, this practice or this inquiry into what it means to belong is really a a deep and uh, vast inquiry. It includes the obvious ways of how we belong to each other, how we appreciate and honor both our similarities and our differences what our personalities contribute in a room, in a community, what our skillful habits of mind offer up to each other when they're expressed in beautiful ways, of generosity and gratitude and patience and all the flavors of love. And it also includes this understanding and acceptance of the forces that are manifesting in the collective right? The forces of resolve, right? That are, we can see in the movements in fighting for justice in any, in any number of ways, that beautiful quality of heart that is a, a main, is a, a real important part of who we are and how we've come to be the way that we are as a, as a community over time. And also involves this returning to um, some deep capacity to belong to the earth. Realizing that our bodies are connected to earth, have all the elements of earth, have all the elements of fire and air that our bodies are really manifestations of this birthing and dying process that the earth is continuing to go through. And so in moments when we as humans aren't reliable to each other, which will happen also, where we might not deliver all that we need to in order to support each other's sense of belonging, that there's something deeper that we come home to, some deeper truth, some deeper spaciousness in the heart that helps us connect and ground. I don't know about for you, but it feels like such a rich exploration, this inquiry about how do we belong to each other. That makes me want to continue to show up. That makes me want to continue to do this practice and transform the unskillful habits of mine and use my energies really wisely, both in my personal life and in my civic and social engagements, because I care and understand that all of the seeds I'm planting now will bear fruit at some point in the future and they will contribute some way. Like I don't get a pass of my participation. I could spend the next three years in my closet. I think I said this just recently on the talk I gave on the Labor Day retreat that some of you are on. 
It just sort of came to me in the moment. But as a good example, I could spend the next three years in my closet trying to shut the world away. And that is a kind of participation, right? So we're always participating. Our energies are always contributing. It's the law of karma. Whenever we're intentional about anything, it it leaves a legacy behind. So I'm I'm clear and hopefully we're clear that it's an it's really important to continue to do the work of transforming our unskillful habits and connecting with and cultivating skillful habits to use wisely in our lives and in the world. And alongside of that work, we also completely relax and accept the way that we are, right? Like, oh, look at this, totally a mixed bag I am. So I don't have any delusions about showing up to a program like this and contributing only good, right? Because my mind is mixed. So there's going to be some beautiful quality that shines forward. And there's going to be some insecurity, perhaps, or um, whatever unfinished business that might come forward as well. And that is true in the collective. All the protest, the protest movement that's happening, the civil rights movement that we're living in right now is an example of the, for me, the beautiful ways that human beings continue to express our, our wholesome desires in the world, what show up for what we want, make sure that our voices are heard. Like, no, this, the way things are going right now, this is not okay with me and connect then with other people who share those same values, right? That kind of, uh, persistent engagement, that resolve, that can be rooted in a deep caring for each other is so beautiful. And we're capable of that goodness. Our hearts are capable of that goodness. And our hearts hearts are also capable of, in moments when we're not mindful, in moments when we don't practice well, Our hearts are really capable of doing a lot of destruction, of causing a lot of harm, of causing great injury. And so accepting all of this at a time, especially now for all of us, I don't, there's so many moments when I feel activated that this intimacy with my own heart and all of the messiness here and and this deep intimacy with the way things are in the world really challenges me. Like It feels like a lot, right? The system doesn't quite know how to bear it all. And so in moments, learning how to rest into a sense of belonging to the earth, belonging to nature, belonging to a process of change, belonging to impermanence. Like, oh, this body is just like the path, the path of trees and grass and seasons and birds and everything having its own course, having its own lifespan. This body is really a representation of all of that. And in that moment, in a moment where this, the spaciousness of the heart can connect with that reality there can be a deep settling there, a deep resourcing settling. It's like being able to return to that which belongs, everything that belongs, all of life that belongs, every human, every expression of life, and what it shares in common, what we all share in common.
So I'm curious what you rely on when you need to return to a sense of belonging. And especially at times when it doesn't feel like as human beings, we're really showing up for each other in the way that we need to. How do you return to that renewing source where everything belongs? And what are the ways that you are contributing what you know about belonging, what you're learning about belonging in your own life and in the world, in the collective? Those are just a couple of questions to get us started. But anything else that you have to say, questions, reflections, anything you have to say about this topic would be useful. Appreciate how she describes what seems like, you know, I think practice is a, can see that the path of transformation includes being intimate with the painful experiences sometimes. And that seems so counterintuitive, right? If something's painful, don't we want to get away from it? At the paradox, that is, that's the ex- exact way to develop courage and to keep showing up in our lives, right? Just to keep saying, yes, oh yeah, it's like this. Look at that. I don't have to be afraid of this anymore. And so I think Sevene does an uh, exceptional job of describing this paradox that, yeah, it's a total delusion that we don't belong. And yet the reality of our lives is that we're, we continue to be met with this experience of not belonging. And that's the human one. And depending on our identities and our life experiences, it might feel that way a lot of the time. And she talks about many of the ways that, you know, as a black woman, she has um, experienced this. And as it certainly as a queer person, I can relate to that. And yet that, that willingness of the heart to return to something deeper Something more expansive, more spacious, feels really useful. There's a wonderful talk on 10% Happier. Sharon Salzberg just gave a talk. Sharon um, has a new book out, too, called Real Change. And um, in the talk, uh, she's talking about uh, one of the things that she mentions is uh, she was asked to offer a minute of mindfulness, like a few mindfulness activities for kids in cages living at the border. And so she did this, offered these minute long mindfulness, uh, meta, mindful meta, I think, I can't remember what she called them. And she got a lot of, um, in her Twitter feed, people were really chastising her for thinking that she could just uh, offer loving wishes without action and that would be enough. So she talked about how she took this in. It was painful to read and acknowledge that there acknowledge that uh, it is a painful thing to imagine that. And Buddhists, we can go through this sometimes where we think that sending metta might be enough. And so we don't want to be in denial that action is not needed that our advocacy and our activism and our engagement, civic engagement, we don't want to be in denial that it's, it's enough to do without that because actually it's a part of the path too. engagement is an essential part of the path, but that action that is rooted in something expansive, something bigger, some an energy that is, can hold it all is really important, right? So this, expansive, boundless quality of metta that action can then come from is so makes it a sustainable effort. Really useful for me to think about my practice as an inquiry instead of a goal oriented thing, like a destination that tends to be how I relate to the precepts. Like, oh, these are inquiries that can be deepened day after day after day. So I appreciate just, yeah, what you've just said and how it's it's a struggle, right? And this is how we find our way forward by being in the struggle. Patrice. I 
Okay, I'm, I'm sitting here. I'm looking over my computer on my bulletin board, and I have a quote by Joanna Macy that says, when we open to the pain of the world, we discover our interconnectedness in the web of life. This is the gift of dark and dangerous times to find again our mutual belonging. And I have really, in the past couple of weeks, just been finding a lot of Joanna Macy's wisdom, um, a real um, refuge, because she talks so much about um, trusting in uh that in our collective efforts, if we uh, trust in the wisdom of our own species and other species, that um, that we'll find the courage and intelligence to whatever's required. And, um, you know, it resonates with what Lama Rod said about, you know, grounding in gratitude grounding in the sense of community, in the love of the earth, in the ancestors. And um, that has just seemed to me to be so helpful because so often I just wake up with the sense of heaviness and the sense of, am I doing enough? Am I doing it right? Um, you know, just this... Uh, this kind of uh, doubt about my own activism, my own efforts. And so I have really been trying to um, not be so much sort of the little engine that could, but instead really, um, really taking heart in our interconnectedness in our, you know, in our collective um, good intentions. Um, Lou Richmond sometimes, often says he, he sort of recasts the, uh, the characteristics about um, Dukkha, Anatta, and Anicca as uh, everything is connected and nothing lasts and you are not alone. And that that's the great truth. Of, those are the truths of our existence. And so that's been really, really helpful to me, uh, especially when I, I find myself just being a little overwhelmed by the magnitude of the effort. For me, it really begins with the, you know, the simplest practices of feeling my body and accepting my body and feeling the flow of breath in and out of my body. And just like remembering with and doing this with an inquiry, like, Oh, this belongs like this breath belongs. This body belongs. How do I know it belongs? Because it's here. Right. And, and then, you know, when I'm practicing in, really basic ways by just acknowledging emotions and and remembering that anything that's here any experience that we meet is here lawfully so you know at a deep level it it belongs it belongs here because it was born out of causes and conditions right there's no whatever's here is directly related to the its history, the legacy of the previous moment. And so it really, everything really belongs. So with every breath, every moment of fear, every body sensation, it's like, oh yeah, this is all arising because of something. This is all, it's not because of, you know, like Shelley made something happen, but this, Every aspect of my being is here lawfully. There's no denying. That's just the, that's the truth of karma. 
So it may not feel like my mind might play tricks on me and it might feel like I don't belong. But in a sense, I actually do everything I can see, taste, feel, hear, you know, just this whole system actually belongs. It's a part of nature. And so any way that I can orient myself to that reality is, is useful. Sometimes I can trace back my own thought processes or my own behaviors and values again, back to like early childhood as a way of understanding belonging. Oh yeah, I got this from somewhere. And actually my parents got this from somewhere and their parents got this from somewhere. So all of this is, I, I'm a living, breathing organism and representation of my ancestors. So this whole system belongs. We have about a minute. I'm wondering if Patrice, if you'd do us the honors. So this beautiful Buddhist ritual of imaginative generosity that we all get to participate in. So take a moment and just imagine that if there's any benefit from our time together tonight that we gladly and joyfully share it with others. We share it with parents, teachers, friends, family, our Dharma community, all of our communities, all the many ways we belong. We share it with those who are difficult for us. Those for whom it's a challenge to see our mutual belonging. And we share this goodness with all living beings, all the animals, all the birds, the plants, the insects, to beings imagined and unimagined. We would happily, gladly share whatever goodness comes of our practice in the hopes that all beings live with ease and love and find a kind of liberation in their own true natures. Thanks, Patrice. Thanks to everyone for being here, contributing, participating, engaging. <laughs>